Open your Bibles to Acts chapter 6. That's where we'll pick up today. And it's good to be back. I'm telling you, it is, uh, it's good to be back preaching today. It's been a little bit of a hiatus. Uh, I had planned to be out for about three weeks as, as school was ending and, and we were into the summer. And, and, uh, and, uh, and so I, I'd planned to be off for about three weeks. And, and then I was planning to come back and we were going to preach this sermon about three weeks ago, or actually almost four weeks ago now. And, and Pastor uh, PJ had come back from the student trip and he said, man, I've got a word that I really feel like I need to stand and preach. And I'm like, all right, man, by all means, let's, let's do that. And so he preached and then there was going to be a, a one-off between that sermon and then last week in our, um, in our um, uh, uh, 14-year celebration. And I'm like, man, I don't want to break this one up because it's, it's about, about Stephen. And so uh, I, I'm like, I don't want to preach that that week. And so Pastor Kyle stepped in and just knocked it out of the park. And then, um, and then we had our 14-year celebration uh, last week. And so finally we get to be back and do this. I, I was out of the pulpit so long, I actually talked to Paul McDay. You know, he does our finances here. And I'm like, Am I still on payroll? I mean, it's been a minute since I've actually preached. So, am I still getting a, a paycheck this week? He was like, oh, "We'll see." Uh, so, uh, we're. Uh, but I'm really glad to be back. Uh, so, let's jump in to where we were. Uh, uh, so, from Pastor Paul's sermon just a few weeks ago, uh, look back at Acts chapter six, verse five. This is what the text says. Um, uh, and, and so, he talked about. Uh, uh, Pastor Paul talked about. Uh, uh, people being chosen to serve and, and how uh, we talked about deacons and, and things like that. But this, this is what the text says in verse five. While they were, st while they, uh, so, and what they said, please the whole gathering. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. And, and so uh, uh, Pastor Paul talked about why it's important that we have deacons and, and why they, uh, deacons were appointed and what they all do and the responsibilities that they have and, and the differences in elders and deacons. And, and so he shared all that with us um, a couple of weeks ago, and I hope that brought some clarity to you if you didn't understand those differences. We have elders here. We believe the scripture teaches very clearly that elders got appointed in every church. Multiple elders were appointed in every church, and, and so we, that's why we think that it's important to have multiple elders and a plurality of elders uh, in the church. Uh, and so we had uh, both then and now we have both elders and deacons, um, uh, and it allows the elders, deacons allow the elders to do what elders are called to do, devote ourselves to prayer, devote ourselves to the work of the word, and so our deacons do such a great job. I don't see the office of bishop anymore uh, listed in the, uh, in the, in the New Testament, uh, but some people still think they are, and, and so we'll just let that play out the way it goes. Uh, but we're thankful for our refuge uh, deacons uh, and the way they serve us so well. So back to the text. Today's text um, and so this text tells us that Stephen was full of the Spirit, uh, full of faith, and full of the Holy Spirit, full of grace and full of power. Look in uh, Acts chapter 6, verse 8, it says, And Stephen, just what I said, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. And so can you imagine what that might have been like? I mean, what, the scripture doesn't really get into a whole lot of detail about what those particularly were, but so it just leaves us a little bit to our imagination. What kinds of signs and what kinds of wonders was Stephen actually participating in? What, what was he doing uh, that, uh, that was described here uh, in Acts? Uh, I, I can tell you, it probably wasn't what we see get promoted today. Whenever we think of signs and wonders today, sometimes it becomes so sensationalized that you go, is this just for show? You know, as, as I was kind of studying through this, one of the things that uh, really struck me that I think is important for us to remember is throughout the New Testament, throughout the time when Jesus was here and throughout the time we see with the apostles, there's just very few, in context of the number of years that were involved in this, few miracles that were actually done. Few miracles that are actually recorded. Few signs of wonder. We read them because they've been clustered together for us in the New Testament. But the truth is, in, 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 throughout all the people that he interacted with, there were just very few in the full context of signs and wonders and even miracles that we saw happen right away. I actually heard um, R.C. Sproul talk about that this week. I was listening to a sermon, and he just happened to mention this. He said, you know, 
signs and wonders and miracles weren't, hey, uh, I need to heal this particular person in the scriptures when we read it. And it wasn't a, okay, now you're healed, and it takes just a minute, it might take a week, it might take a, a month for this person to be healed. That's, that's not the way we see. Be, Jesus instructed, he either healed someone instantaneously, or he said, you go and do this very thing, and when you do that very thing, you will be healed. They, these were instantaneous type miracles that were going on. Does God still work miracles today? Yes or no? Yeah, of course he does. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So he has the ability to do whatever he wants to, whenever he wants to do those kinds of things. But what we see, the overwhelming majority of, especially from televangelists that you may watch on TV today, is not really miracles happening, but money grabs happening. Trying to milk people out of their money, out of their savings, out of things like that, rather than miracles actually happening. I, I always want to say, bro, you, wanna, you, you say you've got the, the, the gift of healing, you've got miraculous healings always come through you, meet me down at St. Jude, right? You, you want to do something like that? You want to impress me with what you can do? Meet me down there, and then we'll have something to talk about. Other than that, drop your money grab and go somewhere else. If you're somebody who follows a person like that, and you're giving stuff to uh, the likes of lots of people, uh, uh, don't send them your hard-earned money. Send it to refuge. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I'm kidding. Don't send them your hard-earned money. They're out to grab your money. That was not in my notes, but that's just the way I feel about that. And just so you, uh, that's where I stand in case you're wondering uh, what was going on. But what was happening here is that the, the Bible records, the scriptures record that Stephen was in the middle of doing all types of signs and wonders. And we can uh, honestly know that it was accomplished through the power of the Holy Spirit. And, and so as you're going through this and as we're reading through this, as, as you're reading the text, it, you would think, man, that's a good thing, right? I mean, if that's happening and Stephen's part of it, you would think that's a really good thing. And you would think that most people would say, hey, that's a really cool thing that's happening. Let's kind of follow him and see what's going on. Let's, let's rejoice around the things that were happening during this time. Um, pointing people to the resurrected Jesus. Hey, this is because Jesus has been resurrected and he has given us, he, the Holy Spirit is now working in and among us and through us because he has sent the Spirit to be part and dwell us. You would think that's a good thing. However, um, uh, some people didn't think that was such a good thing. And honestly, we shouldn't be surprised as we read the text today that people turn their anger towards Stephen. If they turn their anger towards Jesus in the day, why would they not turn their anger towards Stephen whenever he is doing these things in the name of Jesus, right? So let's look ahead to verse 9 and see what it says. It says, Then uh, some of those who belonged to the synagogue and the freedmen, as it was called, and the Cyrenians and of the Alexandrians and those from Cilicia and Asia rose up and disputed with Stephen. And so the question becomes, who are these people? Who are all these people that, that just got listed in the text? And so the, the freedman was an actual name for, uh, for people who were former slaves and their descendants. And, and so what we understand about them is, is they were enslaved in, um, uh, it, it, by the Romans during the time, but they were such devout Jews that they continued to follow uh, their Jewish traditions. I mean, they, they wouldn't do any work on the Sabbath. Uh, they were very strict in their dietary restrictions. Uh, they followed a kosher law very closely. And so what we understand from, what, from commentators that I've read that said they kind of became useless as slaves because they wouldn't do what the people that quote unquote owned them would do. And so they kind of dismissed them. And so they were referred to as the freedmen during that time. The Cyrenians, they were from Cyrene, which is, yeah, there you go, there's the name, uh, which is around where modern day Libya uh, would be now. Uh, and it talks about these, uh, they, were, they were lots of, uh, uh, a large population of Jews that were part of this group of people. Uh, uh, Cilicia, part of the province of modern day Asia, uh, is around where Saul of Tarsus had come from, or, you know, where Paul had come from during the time. And so this was this group of people that were approaching uh, Stephen in, that we see in our text right here 
in verse 9. And so the text says that they disputed with Stephen and they argued with him over the fact that he was doing these great signs and these wonders at the time. And so I guess the question would be, why were they arguing with him? I mean, why were they, if they could see what he was doing, why were they spending their time disputing and butting heads with him? I would say it comes from a few places. One, I would say it comes from their misplaced religious fervor, okay? Their misplaced religious fervor. Think about it in terms of if I've always, uh, like I grew up in the Southern Baptist Church, and I I love the Southern Baptists. Uh, That is part of my heritage, part of my a background, but man, that's all I understood. I, I mean, that's, uh, that, that's all I knew was Southern Baptist theology, Southern Baptist uh, uh, polity, like how the church was set up. That, that's all I ever knew. And so if that's all I'd ever been taught, then that's all I would ever knew. Some of you are the same way. You grew up in a particular denomination, and that's all you ever knew because that's just where you grew up. That's just how you were told things were. And so I think sometimes, and and so for me, as I encountered something new, um, I was like, oh, wait a minute. I don't think that's right. You got to be wrong because I've been told this my entire life. And so I think sometimes I had some misplaced religious fervor over just the fact that somebody understood or interpreted or lived out their uh, upbringing in uh, their religious understandings different than what I did. I think that was some of this. I think some of it could have been jealousy. Some of it could have been just strife, that they were just looking for a fight. You know, some type in, in religious circles, some people just looking for a fight. You ever been part of that? Somebody just looking for a fight. I'm going to argue with you over your theology. I'm going to argue with you over how you do church. You refuge people come dress in your short shorts and your short sleeve shirts and you don't wear long pants or whatever the thing is. Some people just want to argue over some of the most minute things. Some of it could have been anger. Some of it could have been because they were threatened. They felt threatened in their standing, in their religious standing that they had, or or just their religious history that they had. And again, some of those things that we see happen then, or just the opposition happen, sometimes happens to us today. Let's keep going. Verse 10 says, but they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. Scripture says that no matter what their opposition was, no matter what it was that they came against Stephen, they had no leg to stand on whenever they would oppose him. And so he, the way I see this, again, Acts doesn't specifically describe it, but when taking from this, you can almost see them standing and talking and them having an opposition to him. And Stephen coming back with some wisdom, they're like, oh, okay, you got me. Uh, and then they come with another opposition and Stephen with his wisdom and probably his eloquence at the time would respond and they're like, oh, foiled again. You know, uh, whatever, you know, I, I see like Batman uh, uh, things dealing with the Joker and things. Uh, uh, but they're like, oh, missed it. Or Popeye's way I say right now. Uh, (laughs) uh, Sorry. (laughs) Disregard me. Uh, But again, no matter what they came with towards Stephen, uh, he had something to say back. That's what we can infer from the text. And and, and so that kind of works both ways that uh, when you come at someone that that they have the answers and they they might uh, refute you, it kind of, the other side of the coin is somewhat the same thing. That it's important for us as followers of Jesus to listen to people that we might listen to with a very discerning ear. Okay? It's important for you, listen to me, Christian, it's important for each of us to listen to people, specifically whenever they stand to say that I'm speaking uh, for the Lord, I'm speaking on behalf of what the Lord has given us in the scriptures. It's important for us to listen with a discerning ear. For you to discern, for you to understand what people are trying to sell you, for you to listen and, and, and hear and really, uh, what, it, what is it that they're trying to say? You need to listen with an ear to hear. Most of the time, we do passive listening. Some of you are passively listening to me today. And I'd like for you to pay attention. You should listen to me with a discerning ear. It's what Pastor Scott's saying, line up with the scriptures. 
You need to listen for truth. You need to listen for error. You need to listen and discern those things. You need to embrace the truth as it is spoken from this pulpit. Over the, again, over the last six weeks or so, multiple men have stood in this pulpit and preached the word of God. And I hope you listen with a discerning ear for what the truth it was that they had to say. Listen with a discerning ear. Be aware of error. Look, I'm human, and there could come a time that what I say from up here might be an error. And you should listen for that, and you should hear that. And, you should, and if there's error spoken from here, you should bring that to us and go, Hey, Pastor, I think what you said about X, Y, or Z is an error. I'm not asking you to get on Facebook and, and post it. I'm not asking you to get on the Twitter and post it or on the gram. Is that right? Thanks. And post it on the Instagram or whatever. I'm asking you to come to me or whoever stands in this pulpit and say, hey, pastor, I think you might be in error over this thing. It's important for us to expose error if there is error. Always listen for someone who says they are speaking on behalf of God, that they're actually speaking the truth from the scripture. So how do we do that? It's important that you understand the Bible and you read the Bible and you ask the Holy Spirit to give you a discerning ear and you go, is that what, is what Pastor Scott or whoever is saying that, is, he, is that what he's saying is the truth? Especially if it just doesn't sit right in your spirit during, the, during a time of something. I would say this. It's important that you oppose someone who consistently teaches false doctrine. If you ever get that here at Refuge, you know what we tell you to do? Leave and go find another church. If false doctrine is ever preached, or is specifically consistently preached from this pulpit, find another church. Our hope is that that never happens. It's important for us as elders that we guard doctrine very closely uh, and that's why a plurality of elders is so important to us for sure. But, listen, but before you go off on your doctrine witch hunt, be sure, be very sure. And, and, and you may not like just because they might be stepping on your toes. Well, I don't read the Bible that way, preacher. Why are you messing all in my business, preacher? I think I'll find myself somewhere else to go. You stepping all up in my mess. You know, be thankful that someone's willing to do that. Be thankful that someone's willing to step up in your mess from the word of God and say, thus says the word of God, thus says the Lord. Be thankful that someone would be willing to do that very thing. Listen with a discerning ear. Reject what is, is false and embrace what is true. They had a tough time with Stephen because they couldn't find any holes in what it was he having to say. Let's go on to verse 11. Then they secretly instigated men who said, we've heard him speak blasphemy, blasphemous words against Moses and God. Now, underline secretly instigated, if you're an underliner and if you're not, become one. Uh, underline secretly instigated there in verse 11. Then he goes on to verse 12. And they stirred up, underline stirred up. They stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him and seized him and brought him before the council, verse 13, and they set up false witnesses, underline false witnesses, under, uh, the, who said, this man never ceases to speak words against this holy place and the law, for we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses delivered unto us. And so they instigated men. They, they got people together. They drew some people together and said, this is what we want you to go and say. And so those people told lies. They uh, stirred up, uh, they misrepresented Stephen. They stirred up the elders and other people in their own community. Uh, and again, back to, uh, back to that, D don't, 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 mis don't misrepresent what people stand and say. Don't bring a charge against someone if it's not true. Don't be someone who stirs up people over very minor things within the church. You've heard us say that part of our job as shepherds and under shepherds in the church is to feed the sheep, to bark at the dogs. Those are people who just like to talk a lot and stir up trouble. To bark back, you know, if you bark at a, that a dog's barking, if you go back at him strong, what does he do? Normally, he'd be, he's quiet. 
to rebuke the swine, those that might find themselves just stirring in the mud and just wallowing in the mud, to rebuke those who are just living in their sin, to rebuke the swine and to shoot the wolves. And so I've said it before, we won't literally shoot you if you're a wolf here, maybe, but to drive those who are here to destroy and to destroy the work that God is doing, to drive them out because that is, uh, we don't need wolves that are part of the sheep. Those of us who are following Jesus, because that becomes dangerous uh, to the church itself. It says they stirred up the elders. They stirred up the scribes. They stirred up the people. And then they seized him. They grabbed him. They brought in false witnesses. They lied about what he said. And they even hearkened back to Moses and said, he's even saying that what Moses said was not even true. They were troublemakers. They were liars. The text tells us that, that they made stuff up. They were corroborators. Say corroborators. corroborators. Say it again. Corroborators. Again, we sound like, sound like the Hamburglar. Uh, and, and so they gave support to these false statements. They were like, hey, yeah, what he said, th this guy's saying something untrue, and someone else would come and go, yeah, what this guy said is right about those guys. And so they were stirring the people up. They were corroborating the uh, false statements. They brought in false witnesses, and they were saying enough truth to, to say, man, what he's saying is probably true. They said enough around it to go, yeah, I, I can get on board with that. And such is the nature to those who oppose the truth. Say enough to confuse people. Include enough truth to make you think that it's true and yet have a sinister plan and sit on a throne of lies. Stephen looked like an angel, though. What the, that's what the text tells us in verse 15. Verse 15 says, And gazing at him, all who sat in the council saw that his face was like the face of an angel. And so the, the terminology around this kind of evokes awe. And it, it, it's making us think, it's wanting us to think that, think about Stephen, that, that his face looked like an angel. And I have to believe that uh, there was something about Stephen's countenance that, that, that obviously uh, uh, provoked him to say he looked like an angel. Because maybe he knew what was about to come. Maybe he was actually seeing an angel because he was about to go to his death. We'll see that in chapter 7. Gazing at Jesus, maybe. Because this he was about to be in his last few moments here on the earth. Who knows what exactly it means. But that's what the text says, that he had an, a face that looked like an angel. Let's look at Stephen's response in Acts chapter 7. I'm going to read this because it's important that we read this entire thing. So I hope you've got your Bibles there. Acts chapter 7. So get on board because I'm going to read it pretty fast because it's a long text. And, um, and I want you to follow along with me. Acts chapter 7. And so the high priest said, hey, Stephen, are these things so? Is this all these things that these people are about? Are these things so? And he, and he gives Stephen a chance to respond. And this is what Stephen says. Brothers and fathers, hear me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran and said to him, go out from your land and from your kindred and go into the land that I will show you. Then he went out from the land of the Chaldeans and lived in Haran. And after his father died, God removed him from there into this land in which you are now living. Yet he gave him no inheritance in it, not even a foot's length, but promised to give it to him as a possession and to his offspring spring after him, though he had no child. And God spoke this to effect, that his offspring would be sojourners in a land belonging to others, who would enslave them and afflict them 400 years. You see what he's doing? He's going back. Stephen's going back, and he's essentially giving an overview of the entire Older Testament. Verse 7, but I will judge the nations that they serve, but God, said God, and after that they shall come out and worship me in this place. And he gave them the covenant of circumcision. You know, I'm always thinking, could you come up with something else? Uh, and so Abraham became the father of Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. And Isaac became the father of Jacob and Jacob of the 12 patriarchs. Verse 9, and the patriarchs, jealous of Joseph, sold him into Egypt. But God, circle that, but God was with him and rescued him out of all of his affliction and gave him favor and wisdom before Pharaoh, king of Egypt, who made him ruler over Egypt and over all of his household. Now there came a famine throughout all of Egypt and Canaan and great affliction and our fathers could find no food. But... 
When Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent out our fathers on their first visit. And on the second visit, Joseph made himself known to his brothers, and Joseph's family uh, became known to Pharaoh. And Joseph sent and summoned Jacob, his father, and all his kindred, 75 persons in all. And Jacob went down to Egypt, and he died, he and, his, and our fathers. And they were carried back to Shechem and laid in the tomb that Abraham had bought for him for a sum of silver from the sons of Hamor and Shechem. Verse 17, but as the time of the promise drew near, which God had granted Abraham, the people increased and multiplied in Egypt until arose over Egypt another king who did not know Joseph. He dealt shrewdly with our, uh, with our, uh, with our race and forced our fathers to expose their infants so that they would not be kept alive. He killed all of them so that the babies would die, trying to wipe them out. And this time, at this time, Moses was born, and he was beautiful in God's sight, and he was brought up for three months in, in his father's house. And when he was exposed, Pharaoh's daughter adopted him and brought him into her own, as her own son. And Moses was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was mighty in his words and deeds. When he was 40 years old, it came to his heart to visit his brothers, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them being wrong, he defended the oppressed man and avenged him by striking down the Egyptian. He supposed that his brothers would understand that God was giving them salvation by his hand, but they did not understand. And on the following day, he appeared to them as they were quarreling and tried to reconcile them, saying, Men, are you not brothers? Why do you wrong each other? But the man who was wronging his neighbor thrust him aside, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Do you want, us, you, do you want to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? And th at this retort, Moses fled and became an exile in the land of Midian, where he became the father of two sons. Now when the 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai, in the flames and the bush. And when Moses, saw that he was, when Moses saw it, he was amazed at the sight, and he drew near to look there, and came, and, and came the voice of the Lord. I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, and of Isaac, and of Jacob. And Moses trembled and did not dare to look. Then the Lord said to him, take off the sandals from your feet, for the place where you're standing is holy ground. I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their groanings, and I've come down to deliver them, and now come, I will send you into Egypt. This Moses, whom they rejected, saying, who made you a ruler and a judge? This man God sent as both a ruler and a redeemer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. This man led them out, performing wonders and signs in Egypt and at the Red Sea in the wilderness for 40 years. This is the Moses who said to the Israelites, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. This is the one who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him at Mount Sinai. And with our fathers, he received living oracles to give to us. Our fathers refused to obey him, but thrust him aside. And in their hearts, they turned to Egypt, saying to Aaron, Make for us gods who will go before us. And for this Moses who led us out from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And they made a calf, the golden calf that we read about in the Old Testament. They made a calf in those, calf in those days and offered a sacrifice to the idols and were rejoicing in the works of their hands. But God turned away and gave them over to worship the host, uh, gave them over to worship the host of heaven, as it is written in the book of the prophets. Did you bring to me slain beasts and sacrifices during the forty years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? You took up the tent of Molech and and, and the star of your god Rephan, and the images that you made to worship. And I will send you into exile into Babylon. God said, I see what you did. You've made false gods before me, and I'm going to send you away. Verse 44, our fathers had the tent of witness in their wilderness, just as he who spoke to Moses directed him to make it according to the pattern that had been. Our fathers in turn brought it, uh, brought it in with Joshua when they disposed of the nations that God drove out before our fathers. So it was until the days of day, so it was until the days of David who found favor in the sight of God and asked to find a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. 47. But it was Solomon who built the house for him. Yet the most high does not dwell in houses made by hands. He doesn't dwell in houses made by hands. As the prophet says, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what kind of place is my rest? Did not my hand make all of these things? And that's the, that's, that was Stephen's message. He basically recapped the entire Older Testament right there at that time. 
And then Stephen reminded them. He said, despite the, te the temple of Solomon, this is where the actual truth is. Look what it says uh, again in verse 48 through 50. Yet the Most High does not dwell in houses made by hands, as the prophet said. Heaven is my throne. The earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Did not my hand make all these things? See what Stephen said there? There is no temple that can hold God. There is no dwelling place that can hold God, that can contain God. There is no place that you might build with your own hands that can hold the Most High God. He does not dwell in houses made by hands. The entire existence of the universe is the home of God. It says it. He said, heaven is his throne and the earth is his footstool. Get, the, get that mental picture of that? Heaven, the heavens, the entire heavens is his throne. He sits on the throne of the heavens and he props his feet up on the globe. That's the image he wants you to see. He wants you to see how God, uh, gigantic and big and mighty who God is. You can't contain who he is. Saying today, this brick and mortar is not the house of God. I, I know you probably grew up in traditions, you might say it today and all those kind of things, that this is the house of God. No, no, no. You are the people of God who has come in to dwell together, who has come in to worship the God of the universe. This is not the house of God. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Where does God dwell today? Where? Yes, in, in us. Jesus said, it's better that I go away and I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to come, and he will indwell you and me as believers. He doesn't live in brick and mortar. He exists everywhere. If you're born again, you are the temple of the Holy, Holy Spirit. And that's what Stephen was saying. Then, uh, Stephen pulls a Jerry Lawler. Who knows who Jerry Lawler is? Raise your hand. Who does not know who Jerry Lawler is? Raise your hand. Uh, okay. Jerry Lawler is a Memphis wrestler. And he used to come, he used to wrestle here locally. He would come on Channel 5 at 10 a.m. on Saturdays. And it was the best wrestling ever. Bill Dundee, <laughs> Brute Bernard and the Angel. Uh, uh, it, 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 Memphis wrestling couldn't be anybody. But when Jerry Lawler was fighting... And you knew that he was about to drop the hammer. What was the first thing he would do? Pull his strap down, yes. So Jerry Lawler wore this onesie. And, <laughs> and it had a strap over one shoulder. And if Jerry Lawler was about to bring the hammer, he would pull his, it, was, it was over his right shoulder. He would pull his strap down. And typically, what would he do next? Lift up the hammer, right? And he, he would look at it. And sometimes he would wrap a chain around it. And in his other hand, he would bring fire from those tights somewhere. I don't, I, don't know, I don't know where that came from, but it was in there somewhere. And so you knew it was really bad. And sometimes he'd crawl up on the top rope and, and, and you know, might throw fire in somebody's face and jump down and land on them and with the chain begin to just pummel them. That, remember that? I ain't lying here. This, this is like true. And so that's what Stephen's about to do, okay? And so as you, as you write, write, if you're a writer in your Bible, go just write, Stephen's about to go Jerry Lawler on them, okay? That is not blasphemous. That's what's about to happen. Look what it says. Look what the text says in verse 51. And, and so what it says, uh, and, and so he just changes his tune. He says, you stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in the heart and ears. You always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? Which one did they not persecute? All of them. All of them. And they killed those who uh, announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, who you have now betrayed and murdered, you who received the law as delivered by an angel and did not keep it. This is all your fault. This is all you. Pow, pow, pow. That's what he's just doing. 
He's bringing the hammer down on these people and helping them realize that you may be mad at me, but this is all about you. That's what he tells them. He says, you are just like your fathers, stiff neck, uncircumcised heart, which means there's no change in your heart. There's nothing different about your heart. You are not even part of the promise because your heart has not been changed. You resist the Holy Spirit. Some of you here resist the Holy Spirit. Some of you sitting in this room today resist the Holy Spirit. You're religious. You go to church when it's convenient. You become a part-timer or some-timer. Let me tell you what's happening. Whatever you're doing along these realms, you're disciplining your family to do the very same thing or less. Okay? That's what you're doing. You become stiff-necked, alienated from the things of God, and you're disciplining your family to do the same thing. Here, here's what happened today. Tell me what of it. Tell me what of this was not true. All of it was true. True for them. And true for some of you today. Some of you resist the Holy Spirit, even hearing the message of the gospel preached regularly. You just resist the Holy Spirit and keep pushing the Holy Spirit away. Not only do you resist, but you dismiss the Holy Spirit. You can tell that the Spirit is stirring in your heart and you're dismissing him, knowing that he's stirring you into something. But you still dismiss him. I've got other things to do. Stephen declared the truth, unapologetic. He didn't demean anybody. He just told the truth. He didn't skirt around the truth. He wasn't concerned about what they thought about him. He didn't recant anything that he said. He was just like the 12 would do, just like the disciples, just like the apostles in the day would do. He didn't let up. He just said for what it was. He said the truth for what it was. He, said, he basically said, without Jesus... You don't even like hearing the truth. Pastor Shane Pruitt's a guy that I follow on social media. He says this, the world has fallen so in love with lies that the truth feels like hate. Some of you thought, thought of that about me just when I was saying that. That preacher's so hateful. No, I'm just telling you the truth. And you may have fallen so in love with a lie that the truth feels like hate to you. It's not hate. It seems that way in the account of Stephen's message. But look in your Bibles at verse 54. Look what it says. Now, when they heard these things, when they heard these things, they were enraged and they ground their teeth at him. It's like they were like, I'm so mad at you. I can't believe you'd say that to me. Anger. Verse 57, they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him and they stoned him to death. All right, I need a volunteer. Who wants to play Stephen? Josh Holly. Thanks for volunteering. Um, you go over on that side over there. Now, who would like to be my other volunteers? Come on, dudes, come on. I need about 12 of you. Come on, come on. <laughs> I need baseball players that can throw really hard. Hey. Yeah, come on. Who else? Come on. Come here, Paul. Come on. Come up here. I'm looking at you. Come on. Give me some more. Stay over here. We're not on his side. Hey, don't come over. Yeah, come on. Everybody grab a stone. You are the only old one. All right, come right over here. Get over, grab a stone. Grab a stone. We're going to throw it as hard as we can yes. at Josh. <laughs> Grab a stone. All right, now I want you to hold the stone. Do you have a stone? Oh, yeah, you're a lefty. Uh, here, get over here so you can get him from the left side. All right, here's the picture. This is Stephen, okay? This is Stephen, and this is the angry religious mob. Now, I want you to hold those stones up, and I want you to be angry. Yes. I want you to be angry, and then I want you to throw them. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I don't want you to throw them, but I want you to picture this. 
I want you to picture what this is. This, is this, this really happened. This is not some fairy tale. This is not some made-up metaphor. You had Stephen, who just declared, basically declared the entire scriptures that they had during the day, declared it to these religious leaders over here who are now worked up and angry, so angry at him, they think that he's spoken blasphemy against what it is that they believe. And they have become so angry with him that they pick up stones and ra raise them up. I really want you to, and I want you to look really angry and mad. Why is Lucas on the front? He's always smiling. <laughs> Lucas, go to the back, back row. Angry people with stones, look, hold them up like you're going to throw them at him. And they threw these rocks time and time again. Think about it. They probably threw the rocks, and because he wasn't dead yet, walk over there and like pick up a rock. One of you, walk over there and pick up a rock. Look, here, I'll, okay. <laughs> Whose kids are these? So let's just say I threw this, let's just say that uh, you threw this rock at him and it hit him and it's still laying here. What would you come to do if you needed another rock? Yeah, come over here and pick this up. Think about that. He just hit Stephen in the head with that rock and he goes back and picks it up again and probably throws it again at him because they were so angry with him that they decided that I'm going to throw these rocks at this guy and I'm going to stone him, and I'm going to hit him in the head as many times as I possibly can because I'm so angry with him until he bleeds to death and dies. That's what happens. Here's the picture. Hold those rocks up again. Here's the picture again of an angry mob willing to throw stones at a man because he spoke the truth about the gospel until the man dies. You can go sit down. I, I can't even imagine what that would look like. I mean, I can't imagine watching someone stoned to death. Imagine that today. Stoned to death because they spoke the truth about the gospel. Spoke the truth about Jesus. That's what happens. Verse 59 says, And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Stephen went to death, went to his death with a glimpse of heaven. Verse 6, he says, falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. As they're stoning him, he says, don't hold this against them. So what do we do with this? Stephen said to these religious people, you are just like your father's. You are stiff-necked. You have an uncircumcised heart, which means your heart has not been changed. You resist the Holy Spirit. You don't listen to what the Spirit has to say. You do what you want to do. You compromise the truth. Today, he might say something like this. You soft play the truth when it comes to abortion. You soft play the truth when it comes to killing babies in a womb. You soft play the truth when it comes to homosexuality. You're unwilling to even speak the truth around something that is uh, contrary to the way that God would have us live. You, you uh, compromise the truth when it comes to marriage. You live so flippantly that you're just okay to move from one to the next to the next without any thought or consequence around it. You compromise the truth when it comes to sexual deviance and our children. You're afraid to say what is right because somebody might write something about you on Twitter. 
Stephen would say, you're a bunch of cowards. Why are you and I such cowards today? Why is there no power? Why is there no power in what we say and what we do for the kingdom? Why? Because we compromise the truth. And as we compromise the truth, we set ourselves amongst other world religions, not unlike the Jewish leaders in Jesus' day who deny the actual truth, become angry about the truth, and try to even destroy those who speak the truth and exchange the truth about God for a lie. So my hope for you, then rather than you and me and all of us continuing in our religiosity and our kind of playing enough along the way just to to do enough so that people think that we're Christians, that we're just a little bit different, rather than continuing on and compromising the truth, my hope for us in light of the good news of the gospel and the truth that we heard from Stephen and that you're going to hear, that you've heard and you're going to continue to hear from this pastor and anybody that stands in this pulpit, not only today and in days ahead, but my hope is that the Holy Spirit will grant you and me a Holy Spirit steeled spine when it comes to the truth around the good news of the gospel. It is my hope that we stand for truth. It is my hope that each of you will speak clearly into culture. You don't have to be mean about it. You don't have to be angry about it. But, you, but it, we are called to speak the truth into culture. We may, we may not even like it, whatever the truth is. But we're called to speak the truth into culture. And we're called to stand strong in the Lord. Make no mistake about it. J.C. Ryle once said this, it costs something to be a real Christian. According to the standard of the Bible, it costs something. There are enemies to be overcome, battles to be fought, sacrifices to be made, an an Egypt to be forsaken, a wilderness to pass through, a cross to be carried, and a race for you and me to run. For Stephen, in his race... The stoning, the horrific, as horrific as it might have been, was as close to hell as he would ever experience. When he fell, when he fell asleep, he woke up in the presence of the king. And for, your, for you here today, if you are outside the household of faith, if you're not a follower of Jesus, if you are a non-believer today, Maybe even oblivious to there is a race to even be run. But we're all running this race. Maybe you, maybe you're hearing this for the first time, but you're not yet a part of the household of faith. Sitting through this sermon today, maybe as close to heaven as you'll ever get. Unless, unless you follow the direction from Stephen and you follow the pleas of this pastor Don't be a stiff-necked person. Listen, don't be stubborn. Don't sit there and clench onto your seat. Don't sit there and go, I'm not going to respond to this dude. He's already made me mad. He's touched on my hot buttons today. Don't sit there and listen and be fooled again by your enemy. Instead, repent, which means to turn from your sinful ways and embrace the hope that is found in Jesus. That is our only hope in life and death is to trust in Jesus. The gospel says this, our message to you, it was Stephen's message that there is hope found in Jesus. I'll tell you today that your only hope is found in Jesus. Not in your ways, not in your religiosity, not in you just giving a nod and a, and, and a wink at church gatherings and from time to time, but your only hope is found in Jesus. My only hope is found in Jesus. Not because I'm a pastor, not because I preach. My only hope is found in the, the, the sinless life of Jesus. 
That his death on the cross, that he shed his blood to cover your sin debt. What does that mean? Preacher shed his blood. I mean, he died. He shed his blood. The scripture says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And that it took the precious blood of the sinless Jesus to cover your sin debt. And that God laid on him the iniquity, the sin of us all. And then God raised him from the dead three days later to be victorious over sin and death and hell. And whenever we repent of our sins, which means to turn away from our sinful ways, to turn away from our sin and put our faith and trust in Jesus alone, he says that we'll be saved, that all of our sins will be washed away, all our sins are covered by the blood of Jesus, and that he gives us new life, that the Holy Spirit comes and indwells us as followers of Jesus, and we are made new creations. Behold, the old has passed away, and the new has come, and that can be for you today. Scripture says this, and with this I am closed. There's salvation in no one else but Jesus. For there is no other name but Jesus given under heaven, given among men by which we must be saved. That was Stephen's message. A message that spread throughout this entire world. This is the message that we find in Acts. And this is my message to you, Refuge Church. Repent. Turn from your sin. Believe the gospel. Come to Jesus today. Let's pray.